Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program called Things We Said Today. This is a weekly conversation in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles, the past, the present, the future, whatever we feel like talking about in the moment. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the four regular co-hosts of the show. You might know me from my other Beatles program, a weekly Beatles syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my three regulars in the show. First of all, we have one of the contributing writers for Billboard magazine, also for Axis, that's A-X-S dot com. And he's also the author of the book Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Say hi to Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. And you forgot Goldmine, too, actually. Uh, I'm, since- oh, we can't keep up with you, Steve. I know, and also, and also, variety. I've been in, I'm, I've been in variety now, so I'm, I'm expanding my boundaries. Okay. Well, congratulations on both those new gigs. Thank you. And also, we have the executive editor for Beetle Fan Magazine, and is also the author of the book Changing Times: 101 Days That Shaped <laughs> the Generation. And that's Al Sussman. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. Hello there, everybody. And also, have, we have our resident musicologist. He also writes for Beatle Fan. He's also a freelance writer for the Wall Street Journal and various publications. Spent many years at the New York Times in their classical department. And he's the author of the book, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop. And also, more recently, the ebook, Got That Something? How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken, and hello, everyone. And on the program this time, we welcome someone who has probably written more Beatle books than anyone we know, (laughs) and that being Bruce Spizer, who has a brand new book because of the 50th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper. He's got a new one out, which is called The Beatles and Sgt. Pepper, A Fan's Perspective. Bruce Spizer, welcome to Things We Said Today. Thanks so much. Glad to be here with fellow Beatle fans and friends. <laughs> <laughs> now, everyone, is, everyone, all Beatle fans are talking about the 50th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper. We're all excited about the big deluxe box set coming out. And your book actually takes a different angle that other books haven't done as far as the Sgt. Pepper release. You want to talk about what that is and what gave you the idea to take this different angle? Well, the perspective I was using was from that of the fans. I felt that uh, Sgt. Pepper affected people in a way that the other Beatle albums didn't, even though one might say Abbey Road or the White Album is their favorite album, or gee, the songs on Rubber Soul are the best the Beatles ever did. I think those albums just didn't have that same effect as Pepper. And so the way it actually started was I was just going to do, and I, about a year ago I wrote an essay, and the idea was I'll get it published somewhere. I figured, you know, it could be in Beetle Fan, could be in Gold Mine, could be anywhere, but let me just get something in the can because the 50th anniversary is coming up. And as we got into this year, I realized that I really didn't want it in a print magazine where it would be black and white with few, if any, color images, and thought no matter what magazine I sent it to, it would probably be edited. It wouldn't have the images I wanted. So the idea was, okay, I can do a 40-some-odd page book myself. And then I thought, well, you know, it would be great if I could get some other pieces written. And I thought, well, Beatle Fan Magazine, on the anniversaries of Sgt. Pepper in the past, it had some wonderful articles And what they were writing about hadn't really changed. So I approached Bill King about seeing if I could use some things that had been written previously. And he had recommended a piece that Al had written uh, that did a good job of showing what the music was going on at the time. And then Bill had written a nice fan recollection, a very long one, in where he talked about what was going on in his life. And since he was a part of the world... It gave a good view of what was happening in entertainment, what was happening in news. And I thought, okay, this is working well. And then I thought, well, it'd be fun to have something about Canada. And, of course, Piers Hemmingson would be the person to go to there. And, um, you know, it just started picking up steam at that point. And then I thought, okay, well, Frank Daniels would be good. Frank's helped me with just about every Beatle book I've done. 
and I thought he could do something on the influences on and of Pepper. And then all of a sudden I realized, okay, wait a minute, this book is starting to get a lot bigger. It's no longer a, a magazine size. And I kept trying to figure out, what do I call this thing? And I had a bunch of titles. And then finally I came up with The Beatles and Sgt. Pepper, A Fan's Perspective, meaning a perspective of the fans. And I thought, well, why don't I just get fans to send things in? So I posted something on my website. I sent out an email blast. And I talked to people who I thought might know other people. And that worked well. And I started getting in. And I thought maybe I'll get a dozen or so. And I ended up at the end of the day having over 80 fan recollections. And after a while, a few of them came in from musicians. You know, Stephen Bishop, who I haven't heard of him in a while. Mm. And this guy, Barry Winslow. And he was with the Royal Guardsmen. Oh, yes, yes. Snoopy and the Red Baron. <laughs> and I thought, you know, come on, Bruce. Musicians are Beatle fans. And so, all right, I knew someone who knew Peter Tork. So she sends him an email. And about 20 minutes later, he has a reply to her, not saying, I'll contribute. Here it is. Beautiful, <laughs> fresh, spontaneous, sincere, typical Peter Tork. And then I thought, okay, I know Pat Denizio of the Smithereens. They love the Beatles. Mm. I called up Pat. Pat, would you be willing to write something? No, nah, Bruce, I'm too lazy to write something. We'll just chat a while, and I'll tell you what happened. I said, great. And that worked. <laughs> and then a, a friend of mine, Lou Simon, had a connection with Billy Joel, and he contacted Billy. And Billy said, you know, I really don't feel like writing something, but I'll be happy to give Bruce an interview. So I interviewed Billy, and that's kind of how we worked it out. And it was great because I did not want a book of, you know, the latest pop diva talking about what Sgt. Pepper meant to her, even though she was born 25 years after it was released. I wanted to, to make the obvious pun, pepper in a few celebrities, as it were, but to really keep the theme of it just being everyday people talking about what Pepper meant to them at the time it came out and later on, whether you were, you know, bought it June 1st or 2nd, 1967, or whether you heard it for the first time in a car on an eight-track player driving in the middle of the desert, you know, whatever. And uh, I think it worked out really well. Yeah, you've got some real key people there that I would automatically think of, uh, Billy Joel certainly being one of them. And I've known for a long time Stephen Bishop is a, you know, major Beatle fan. So um, were any of their reactions of what they wrote about or spoke about, did any of them surprise you? Did you learn anything about about the Sgt. Pepper album from their own perspective that, that uh, you learned something about them and about the album, anything new. Yeah, and, and, the, and I, I would love to tell the Billy Joel story, but I really don't want to give it away because I think anyone who reads it will be blown away by it. But I think his was probably one that if anybody had sent it in, it would have been great. Peter Tork wanted to hear the album on the best stereo system possible. And if you lived in the Hollywood area, that meant David Crosby's. So he went over to David Crosby's and Crosby told him, look, I'm not going to be there, but come on in, I guess. You know, he probably left a key under a flower pot or something. And, you know, Peter said he just sat there and took it all in and was just totally stunned and overwhelmed by it all, mm -hmm. uh, which is what you would expect. But to hear it from you know, a serious musician, and yes, folks, Peter and Mike Nesmith certainly were serious musicians. You know, it was nice to hear how they had just been blown away by it. Um, Barry Winslow's of the Royal Guardsman was interesting because here's a guy in the summer of 67 driving on the road, and here's tracks from Sgt. Pepper, pulls over to listen to it, and is heading into the studio to record Snoopy's Christmas. You can imagine, <laughs> you know, mm. you know, just to me, I found that pretty interesting, you know, the juxtaposition of those two types of things that were going on. Hmm. Before I pass it along to uh, one of my colleagues here, did many of the, the young Beatle fans of the time look at this as being such a big shock, or was it kind of a smooth transition going from, Revolver, and also the Penny Lane Strawberry Field single into Sgt. Pepper. I think it shocked everybody. You know, the old so Sgt. Pepper took you by surprise. Mm. Look, you know, as I say in the essay in the book, the clues were there. You know, you had Revolver. You had Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane. But I don't think anyone was expecting a whole album like that, you know, where one of the more interesting ones was Pierce Hemmingston up in Canada was able to 
be with a friend who bought the album, but they were staying in a place that didn't have a record player. So they spent their first few hours with Sergeant Pepper looking at the cover and trying to figure out the cover and reading the lyrics without hearing the music. So, you know, there were just a lot of strange little stories like that. And, you know, and themes that ran throughout people who listened to Sergeant Pepper with one or both of their parents. And, you know, that certainly hit me as, uh, you know, very strange. And I was very touched by those. Uh, I lost my mom last August and uh, those touched me the most. Mm. Yeah, you just brought up something that, of course, with Sgt. Pepper, it had a lot more to do than just the music. There's the packaging of the album, too, which we'll get into. Al, yeah. how would you like to uh, ask the next question? Uh, okay, well, actually, I'm not going to do too much because, uh, you know, full disclosure, I'm part of the book. So uh, one thing, uh, one observation that I had, though, and Bruce and I have actually talked about this, is the fact that is that I think this is probably the only Beatles album where so many people can remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when they either got their copy of the, uh, of the album or when they did finally get there, were able to sit down for their, for their first listen. For instance, I actually don't remember my first listen to Abbey Road. As great an album as that is, I remember buying it, but I don't remember the circumstances of actually sitting down and listening to it. You know, whereas with Sgt. Pepper, it's my image is as clear as it was, you know, that day in, in, in early June of 1967. Uh, of sitting down and and listening to this album and having the uh, having the jacket in my hand and following the the lyrics for the first time for a pop album, so I think that's Bruce. Let, let me get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's true. You know, everybody seems to have that experience. You know, whether it was somebody lying in bed and waiting till midnight because. Mm -hmm. There was a night when this thing could actually be played uh, on the radio stations legitimately mm -hmm. and knowing he wouldn't hear the whole album, but he would hear some of the songs. And so, you know, he would listen in bed and hear a song or two and then hear more later. Other people talked about, you know, an FM station playing the whole album while others talked about, you know, going to the store. One kid, poor kid, you know, here he is going to a Catholic school and on Friday on his lunch break, you know, he runs home, hops on his bicycle, rides to the record store, rides back home with the album, drops it off, runs back to school so he won't get his wrist beaten with the ruler for being late <laughs> and sits there for a couple hours, you know, just can't, you know, dying for school to end so he can run home and hear the album. You know, you just had all kind of stories like that that, you know, were just really, really cute stories and so many of them, you know, one girl listened to it in a room, and when her mom told her dinner was ready, she screamed, not now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you, know you, could just, you could just picture these things happening, and as I read them, you know, I found a lot of myself in some of them, and I think all the readers will find themselves in some of these as, uh, you know, little snippets of memories, and I, I think that makes it work really well for me. And the other thing was, and in the introduction to the book, I made it clear I had written my essay, you know, almost a year before I solicited these fan recollections. I didn't write it afterwards. Yet so much of what's in my essay or in those fan recollections, which shows, you know, my and my friend's experience really wasn't that unique after all. Mm -hmm. hmm. One thing I'd like to bring up, because Al has said on numerous occasions that the, the weight for Sergeant Pepper, he called tortuous. Mm-hmm. And um, was there, did you sense at the time, this uh, tremendous buildup for the album from I the mean, media? Yeah. Okay. yeah, I mean, from my standpoint, from the first, what I remember about it was that, you know, the Beatles were knocking out, particularly with Capitol, where they did things. You had a new album every couple of months and you had, you know, singles every couple of months. And all of a sudden you had this long gap after Revolver and then a single comes out, no new album. And in the meantime, the monkeys are cranking out these great singles and albums that have some pretty good songs on it. And so, you know, I saw that, you know, friends of mine, you know, were 
converting over to the monkeys, defecting as it were. Mm. And so I think that, um, you know, there was a lot of anticipation uh, about it. And, uh, you know, when the album finally did come out, it, of course, lived up to the hype for most people. There were some that didn't get it. And, um, you know, one of the other essays in the book, which is uncredited, but it was one, any uncredited essay would have been something I wrote. And I did it from what was going on in England in the concluding part of it were uh, reproducing some of the edited responses that Tony Barrow had put together for the Beatles monthly book under his pseudonym. And, you know, in it, there were ones where some people just didn't get it. Gee, I wish the Beatles would quit doing rubbish. I'm going to be a monkeys fan from now on. But a lot of people did get it. And then there were the people who didn't get it at first, but grew to appreciate it. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that was another one of the, the trends um, you saw. But there was a lot of uh, build up and the, the press reactions were, were very interesting. You didn't have Rolling Stone or Cream. You had Crawdaddy, which was in its infancy. And uh, their first issue, they had, uh, rather than reviewing Sgt. Pepper, they had something called a preliminary review. And it was nothing but a pen and ink drawing collage type thing. Although on the next issue, they did make up with it, with, you know, multiple coverage. Time magazine uh, began their article essentially saying George Martin's new album came out last week <laughs> and they praised George Martin. And in reading it, you know, it was almost like they had forgotten about the contributions of John Paul, the other George and Ringo. But then a few months later, they put them on the cover and called them the messengers. Uh, so you had all these wonderful reviews. And then, of course, um, the one that wasn't in that case was uh, <laughs> uh, the one from the failing New York Times <laughs> uh, that would basically pan the album in praise the day in the life and said it was this remarkable piece as a coda to an undistinguished group of songs. Hmm. Well, I, speaking of the New York Times, <laughs> <laughs> why, don't move, why don't we move on to Alan? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, that that... <laughs> That review was really kind of interesting because um, I had always heard that it was, you know, a pan and all that. And when I finally got my hands on it years ago when um, I was sort of doing an archival raid in the Times archives, it did not seem to me like that unreasonable a review. You know, as you say, he, he, he liked A Day in the Life a lot, but his complaints really were, were that – the Beatles have kind of been in a lot of these places before. I mean, he, he made an association between Eleanor Rigby and She's Leaving Home and, and I guess Love You Too and Within You Without You. He, he just, I think, mm. thought they were they were not progressing as as he had expected them to, which is interesting because we, you know, we all listened to the album and thought, wow, this is something totally new. But uh, I think from his perspective, it wasn't. And Shortly after that, the composer, classical composer Ned Roram, wrote a big essay saying, "You know what? All the all the young classical people are listening to the Beatles, not you know, not going to regular recitals anymore." And over the years, both Ned Roram and Richard Goldstein, who wrote the Times Review, have reversed their positions. <laughs> Hmm. You know, Ned Roram says, well, I, OK, I made too big a thing of it. And and Richard Goldstein says, well, yeah, it is a great album, you know. <laughs> but anyway, you know, um, you, you do have I mean, this this sort of does bring up another aspect of the, the book, because um, I think that actually, although the, the title is a fan's perspective and a whole lot of it is devoted to those recollections, there is actually an awful lot more in this book. And I think that people considering whether to look into it or not should, you know, should keep this in, in mind because, you know, some people might not really care that much about what other fans thought. But you've also got all of, as you say, the press reaction. You've got articles about that. You've got Bill King's um, piece about what else was going on musically in 67. And at the end of the book, you sort of do a track by track run through of the the session info, which you know was kind of interesting and I, and I thought well done. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I felt that it needed to be there, and unfortunately, you know, I went ahead and didn't have the advantage of listening to the new deluxe box set. So on one track, uh, I missed it a little bit. Where fixing a hole to fix what I have in there, I knew that both. George Martin and Paul played harpsichord, but I reversed it. And um, when you hear the 
take three in particular, you can hear Paul talking and hitting the keyboard. So Paul's on harpsichord at Regent, which would mean John would be on bass and George's guitar solo was not overdubbed to Abbey Road. And that was the main thing I caught. And of course, trying to be a perfectionist, you go, darn it. But overall, I think the uh, writing what I had did hold up well. The other thing I was able to do was license some, you know, really great photographs from oh, the yeah. Beatles book monthly. Right. And, um, you know, you've seen those in Beatles book kind of small. But when you see them, you know, nearly nine by nine, you really get a you know true view of how spectacular some of those pictures were. And I was able to get some of them in color that, you know, you normally see in black and white. And, you know, and it worked out really well. They were very good to me licensing wise and mm. uh, really appreciated that. Plus, you have all the the ads and things too, which are kind of interesting to look back on. You know, Sergeant Pepper is the Beatles, and um, and those yeah. things, which have always been a special to of yours. Yeah, the the UK one that Alan's referring to is um, that the week the album was coming out, Parlophone or actually EMI was the one who took out the ad, and it said, "Remember, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band is the Beatles," as if you know, as if you know, to make sure people knew. <laughs> that this was the Beatles, you know, and of course today it seems ludicrous and maybe even then it was, but, you know, it was an interesting uh, ad campaign to start a launch that way. You know, and the other fun thing about it was on that particular issue, they had a big article on Monkey Peter. So Peter Tork sneaks into the book another time. <laughs> Another thing that you um, do in the book, which sort of is uh, going against the sort of contemporary um, conventional wisdom, is you are defending the stereo mix. And, yeah. um, uh, you know, it's it's interesting because I've been listening to the, the big box set and um, reading Giles Martin's comments and, and also the, the book that comes with it and they're really stressing how – you know, the Beatles only cared about mono and the stereo mix was an afterthought and they didn't spend any time on it. But if you look in Lewison's book, I mean, you see things like the reprise of Sgt. Pepper, a track that lasts a minute and 20 seconds. They did 10 stereo remixes of, you know, oh. and all through um, they did. So I, I, I was kind of glad to see that you, you stood up for it because I, I like both of those mixes a lot. And uh, the stereo has a lot going for it. It does. And, you know, one of the controversial things, you know, from a purist such as myself was uh, on a day in the life, the way the stereo panned between the speakers I thought was really cool. Mm -hmm. And I was curious to see what Giles Martin would do with it. And he went ahead and had the vocals dead center. And I talked to Giles about it, and he said he had tried it. And he said, you know, it just didn't feel right with the rest of the album. And, and I understand what he's getting at. And, you know, if someone says, OK, Bruce, we have the mono, we have the stereo, we have a stereo remix. What do you prefer? I'm going to say the stereo remix uh, gets my vote. Because I think it was, you know, brilliantly done. And the way I look at it is what Giles Martin did is what his father and the Abbey Road engineers and the Beatles would have done 50 years ago if they had really cared about the stereo and if they had the technology where you could unbounce tracks. And rather than mixing, you know, from four tracks, Giles probably on any track was mixing anywhere from maybe seven, eight, nine or ten different tracks. Mm -hmm. You could put instruments left and right that before could either go left or right because they had already been mixed down um you know when you had to open up new tracks on that four track machine right. so I, I mean i think it's brilliant but i do like the stereo mix particularly i found the day in the life cool i found good morning good morning really great one of the ironies was um being for the benefit of mr kite which should sound better in stereo than mono always sounded better in mono than stereo until the stereo remix. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. You also get uh, you get credit in the back of the book that comes in the box set. Did you have what? What was your input in that? Well, I um, I've had two credits in there. One was for providing images, and it was really fun to see that they had you know my name. You know, you had Bruce Spicer, Ringo Starr, right together. I that was cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Ringo's contributions on the album were significantly greater than mine, of course. <laughs> okay. um, and uh, then the other thing was that I had brought a lot of, a lot of ideas to the table about what to do with the 50th anniversary uh, 
collection and was involved in a lot of discussions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did they take a lot of your ideas? I wouldn't. I don't know if the word "take" is for a lot of my ideas. I'll say use use a lot of your ideas. (laughs) A lot. A lot of my ideas were used. Some of them were not used. Uh, I, I was under the impression anything I suggested was given serious consideration, which is really all you can ask for as a consultant. And I think because they know I'm, you know, both in many ways a purist and also a fan, and they know I attend a lot of fan events, my input was of interest to them because, you know, they know I'm going to Beatle conventions and talking to people. So it's not just a case of me giving, uh, you know, ideas, but a case of, uh, you know, ideas that I have and ideas that I've formulated from talking to other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Steve. Okay. Hello, Bruce. Um, uh, There are a couple of things that I noticed in the book. Alan, you took away my question about the uh, track-by-track thing at the end, which, uh, that's all right, but there is... You missed one thing that uh, that uh, I was going to mention is that not only did you have a track by track on the album, but you also mentioned the stuff that didn't actually make it to the album, right. and that would include, you know, besides uh, Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields, you also had only a Northern song and Carnival of Light, and I yeah. was really curious about that because. I mean, everybody's always been wondering about that, and and there's very little information. I mean, uh, you know, you have just about all the information there is out there on on that. I mean, I've never heard, I've never talked to anybody that's ever. I mean, I, I think uh, Lewis has heard it, but uh, I mean, beyond it, you've never heard any of it, have you? Or have you? Oh yeah, yeah, I've heard it. Oh, oh, you have. Yeah. What did you think? What did you think of it? There were a couple of ways to describe it. One might be makes Revolution 9 sound like yesterday. Uh, <laughs> oh, great. Another one, another one might be, yes, it should be included on anything the Beatles do so everyone else can waste 15 minutes of their life. But look, let's, let's talk about for what it was. It was not intended to be released by the Beatles on any right. album or anything. And it was one of those things where you had to be there. If you were sitting in a dark room... And all these crazy lights were going around and, you know, and you were, well, if you were inebriated or on drugs <laughs> and you had all this music going, it, it could have been really effective. And I think there was discussion whether or not to include it. I wanted it included, but I think the feeling was, you know, it would just not work in the context. I would not have put it on a CD. I would have put it on a Blu-ray disc where you had to make a conscious decision to hear it because it would mm. destroy any listening experience on a CD. But, no, it, it's very disjointed. Uh, there's not much, qu- quite frankly, good to say about it as a musical composition. But, you know, maybe one day Paul will come up with some way to get it out there and maybe have it on a, uh, you know, a 5.1 surround mix with a groovy light show on the screen and you pop it in and, and watch it. And maybe that's what needs to be done with it. I uh, you know, I think it should come out eventually, and I understand the decision not to include it in the box set. See, because I, I, I'm, and I've, I think I've said this, uh, I know, among a, among the four of us, but uh, I've said I don't think it should have come out because I know what the reaction would be, and I think the, especially on social media, the reaction would be horrendous. And, but, you know, um, it's interesting, your, your perspective, I mean, that's, one of the better, more detailed perspectives I've heard on it ever. I mean, I don't think anybody's ever, you know, talked about it with that much detail no. before. I mean, so. I, I was I was lucky. I happened to be. I was at Abbey Road during the remastering of the, you know, remasters. I wasn't there doing any remastering. I basically was going in and a being them to the vinyl and checking liner notes and the like, and uh, walked into Alan Rouse's office. Uh, who has unfortunately died about a year Mm -hmm. ago. Alan was a wonderful, gifted person. And I walked into his office, and he was playing it. And he looked at me and said, you have to leave. And I said, is that what I think it is? And he says, you have to leave. I said, there's no way I'm leaving. I want to hear it. Mm -hmm. And he said, Pfizer, if there's anything on the Internet within the next two weeks about Carnival of Light, you're in deep trouble. So obviously I didn't, you know, disclose that I had heard it at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, there, are, there are fans out there that are curious about all the experimentation that the Beatles did. Yeah. And, you know, if this was to come out, 
I really don't think it would tarnish the Beatles' reputation in any way, as long as it's presented in such a way that people know what it was used for. Yeah, I think if, among some people that would be true, but among others, I don't. I disagree. Well, I disagree with you, Ken. Well, I don't. You're, think- you're curious what they think. I think it should be out. And 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 since, as as you guys pointed out before we started the show, today is the anniversary of Life with the Lions. I think exactly. I think, let's hear it for Carnival of Light. <laughs> mm. Okay. 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 <laughs> one of the one of the other one of the other things I was going to bring up, uh, actually a little different, was that the the book has a feature on the man who's who is named Sergeant Pepper in the. Yeah. Inst- which uh, and I'm I'm shuffling to it now. It's James Babington, and well, I don't I don't recall. Is that a first? Is that the first time that information's been out there? I've never seen it out there anymore. And uh, the credit is to Max Gratinsky, and Max Gratinsky is a pseudonym of Frank Daniels. And, ah! uh, <laughs> Frank and I uh, <laughs> love trying to top each other with finding obscure stuff that I jokingly see only you, me, and fifteen other people in the world to care about. But I really. Uh, think frank did a good job on this one and you know before i would run it i wanted him to confirm with the survivor of the pair that did the cover whether they had indeed based it on him and the answer was yes it had been in the book it has a side-by-side comparison and you can see the resemblance and the guy had quite a colorful history uh you know his whole family and you know and the boer wars and all kind of other stuff so it's always fun when you can have something in your book that you figure most people will not have known. And in every book I've done, I've always said to, you know, a challenge of if anyone can read my book and honestly say they didn't learn something new, I will not only give them their money back, but I'll make it triple your money back guarantee. <laughs> and no one's ever taken me up on it. The thing is that this was from a, a book of military war heroes. And there also was a card series done in the UK well, you know, we, you knew about Beatle cards. In the U.K., they had military history cards. And, uh, you know, Major General Babington was also uh, one of these people that was on a card. So I think the artists got the idea to have the Sergeant Pepper cutout card from those cards. And out of those cards, pick this one as their model. Is that the card that's pictured? Because I'm looking at the side-by-side comparison. Is that the card that's a uh, Babington that's pictured in the book? Well, we took the image from a book. But the card would have been the same as the image in the book. Okay. Okay. But that's, I think that's where they got the idea for a Sergeant Pepper card was you had this military hero card. Right. It, sh- it should be noted, and because I'm looking at the pictures for people who don't have the book, the the um, images are kind of, are reversed. In other words, the real Babington is sitting uh, opposite of the way Sergeant Pepper is, but there, but there's clearly no – question that he is he is the guy there's oh, no yeah. que- no question at all as so. i said in yellow submarine the unca- the resemblance is uncanny right right okay um ken back to you bruce in addition to looking at teenagers and how they reacted to this album do you also take a look at the older generation like the kids parents yeah uh, and, were uh, many of them very accepting of this change in the group yeah, I think, you know, th- th- there are a lot of interesting things going on. One of them, as I mentioned, were kids that, uh, you know, listen to the album with their, you know, a parent. Uh, you know, our good buddy Wally Pajajic listened to the album with his mom. And in his piece, he explains how that came about. There was another guy who, you know, was excited about the album, showed the cover to his father. And his father was doing yard work and said, let's go on the house in the house and he put it on you know the the stereo system in the in the you know the in the big room he didn't have to listen to it on his tiny record player when i'm 64 was a song that bridged the generation gap for many many people there was a a very touching story of a of a guy who said that you know they lived in rural maine and they eventually got the album and whenever their dad wasn't around they would play it and he came home early one day and they were playing it and when i'm 64 was on and their father liked the song, and he said anytime he would be playing, you know, records, his dad would say, can you play me when I'm 64? And uh, the touching part for me was he said that, uh, you know, he says, I turn 64 soon, and uh, when I do, I'll be playing it um, and singing with gusto, imagining being with my dad. Huh. Hmm. So really touching stuff. 
the ironic thing was you had when I'm 64, which brought generations together, and then you had the Generation War saga of she's leaving home on the album, and I found the, that interesting. And yeah. in the New Yorker, this disc jockey said, you know, my son's at Yale, and he told me the entire student body went out and bought it, and people who had friends at Harvard said the same thing. So it was an album that the college students accepted. You could no longer call the Beatles, you know, doing teeny bopper music anymore. You know, this was good, serious music. If you love classical music, it held interest. Um, the editor of The New Yorker used a pseudoname and, you know, talked about this guy who talked about the album. is really him. And he compared it, you know, to things like, you know, great jazz musicians and the like. So, you know, I found that interesting. Um, the younger people, a lot of them had trouble accepting it. It admitted, you know, I didn't particularly like it at first, but after a few listens, I began to enjoy it more. Um, the older people got it right away. And then you had some, like some kid, I think it was seven, who, you know, loved it so much that he said he carried the album around with him everywhere he went that summer. And he sent me this cute little picture of him and his family in their backyard. And he's sitting on a bicycle with the album Gatefold open. I mean, you know, I guess, and that leads me into another section. Let, let's think about when this album came out, we didn't have cameras and cell phones. Mm -hmm. People were not obsessed with taking pictures all the time. Nobody knew what a selfie was. And so I asked if people had pictures of themselves with the album cover taken in 67, knowing there would not be a lot of them. And there were some, you know, about a half dozen. And when you look at them, to me, that's one of the highlights of the book. You have this wonderful shot of these three teenage girls sitting on the steps of their home in Cleveland. And you look at it and, you know, you can see that they're not living in a mansion that, it, you know, they had to save up their babysitting money to get this album. Yet there they are proudly displaying the open gatefold. It's a great contrast to the Beatles, you know, at Brian Epstein's and their fancy clothes and their fancy, you know, Georgian townhouse showing the album jacket open. So, you know, that to me is a great contrast. Uh, you know, then you had uh, Jude Kessler, who writes all these wonderful John Lennon books, and picture of her hugging the album cover in front of the Christmas tree. She had to wait for Christmas to get her copy. <laughs> you know, and then the highlight is Mark Lewis. And, and uh, you know, since I can't show it visually, I guess, spoiler alert, but Mark Lewis did take the scissors to the cutout page and he put on the badges and the sergeant stripes and the fake mustache and had his mom take a picture of him standing in an English garden. And it's it's a wonderfully cute picture. So, you know, you have these wonderful, you know, images of it all. And, uh, you know, it was just really a, a fun book to put together. Hmm. Wow. Very interesting. You know, you always hear these stories about with the older generation, how it took a certain song from the Beatles for them to take the group seriously. Like I always heard about yesterday, as soon as older people heard yesterday, all of a sudden, oh, you know, they really aren't that bad, you know, yeah. but it's interesting to hear, you know, the, the differences in the generations and you got different reactions there from the album. You did. And there were one, one other thing that I found interesting that the song Within You, Without You, uh, many people said that they just didn't get it then. Some of them grew to love it. Others said they still don't like it. But it was interesting because... Uh, one person said they were glad that it started side two because they could place the needle at the beginning of when I'm 64 and not have to listen to it. Mark Lewis talked about in England where the album did not have any visual visual banding uh, that he had to guess where when I'm 64 started. And because of that, the introduction to that song had a lot of scratches from him trying to start the album there when he played it <laughs> on side two. But in all fairness to George, a lot of people said, you know, Boy, it became one of my favorite Beatles songs or one of my favorite George songs. And, you know, I just didn't get it at the time, but what a great song it is. When you hear it in the stereo remix, you get to hear the wonderful Indian percussion a lot more clearly. And it adds, a, a, you know, a great listening experience. And also included in the deluxe edition is the instrumental version with only the Indian instruments. And that's quite a treat as well. Mm -hmm. oh. So that's different than the anthology version. Yeah, yeah which, the is, anthology, which is just the Western instruments. Right. The anthology had, I think, both East and West, mm -hmm, whereas right. this just has the Indian instruments. And 
by themselves, that song is really well developed before George sings a note on it. But you've, you've got the Indian string instruments actually playing the melody that George would later overdub over it. Mm-hmm. Mm. Al, would you like to talk at all about you, you contributed two pieces to the book? Anything well, about those two well, articles? Actually, uh, actually, that does lead me into something. You know, I've actually talked about this here before. Uh, the fact that the that the release of, of Sergeant Pepper and especially the, uh, as I said, the memories that we all have of our first listen to the album, it was really the first the first time that a that an album that the release of an album became an event uh, with a capital E. And, and it wasn't the kind of record business um, oriented uh, type of orchestration. For instance, the you know the Beatles anthology. Everything involved with the the rollout of the anthology was uh, you know was very heavily orchestrated. This was much more organic, and uh, and actually the one of the two people well. The one piece, as I said, that had been in Beatle Fan about 25 years ago, and Bruce specifically asked me uh, asked to have the piece included. Uh, but Bruce asked me to do a uh, a newer piece when we got talking because of the fact that we all seem to have these the these memories of uh, of that weekend. And even though in those days, as as Bruce mentioned before, there was really you know no rock press to be to to speak of, and obviously the the technology that we have now, you know, obviously didn't exist in 1967. But we just knew almost by osmosis over the course of that weekend that everybody that. You know, other than you know, there 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 were some little Beatle fan clubs uh, that had been formed uh, three years before. Uh, you know, networks of girls who listened to the album together, but otherwise, we just kind of intrinsically knew that everyone was experiencing over the course of that first weekend this you know the experience of listening to this. To this very special album for the first time. Yeah, because, and that was the, the reason yeah. I asked Al to write the piece when we were talking about it was, and Al beautifully called it the you know communal Sergeant Pepper. There was no internet, there was no Twitter. You know, nobody was tweeting us saying just got the Fab New Beatles album, listening to it now. Right. There was none of that. But Al and I agreed. We knew. Millions of other people were doing the exact same thing we mm-hmm. were doing. We knew yeah. it. And mm-hmm. Al, you had mentioned uh, the thing about the, the Beatle clubs, and one of the fan recollections was this girl in New Jersey who had her own little Beatles fan club, and they got the album you know, in advance and invited the club members over. She said a lot of the club members had quit because they were upset with the butcher cover and John's Jesus remarks. Um, but she said the interesting thing was when she brought it to school and it was played that the guys really got into it. And it was the album where if you were a guy and didn't like the Beatles because you were jealous of them and the fact they had on girls or you were a tough rock and roller and you didn't like the Beatles. Sergeant Pepper was when the guys who didn't get it at first as far as what's so great about the Beatles. The guys got it. So you had a tremendous expansion of, of it. And what's really ironic about that is Life magazine in its article on the, you know, the new far out Beatles had said, you know, half the Beatles gone so far from what their fan base is accustomed to hearing from the group that, you know, they will lose their fans. And yeah, they did have some defections to the monkeys, but most of the fans stayed with them and they gained so many more fans. They gained older fans, college students, more males. So I think the concern that people had really wasn't, uh, it didn't develop. Uh, Tony Perkins, who wrote a fan recollection, made a similar observation at the end of his piece where, you know, he talked about what it was, you know, being black and being in D.C. And he is this big Beatles fan and he gets into Sgt. Pepper later. And he talked about that. 
and pointed out that uh, he was listening to Stevie Wonder's inner visions and Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, and all of a sudden, that's when he began seriously listening to Sgt. Pepper, and it wasn't that far out to him. It fit in nicely with those albums. Of course, Pepper was out years ahead of it. Mm. So, you know, once again, kind of ahead of its time and influencing uh, not just rock and roll, but, uh, you know, black music as well. And what he said, you know, about them doing this type of album, and he says, what balls these guys had, you know, to do an album this different than anything. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, Bruce mentioned northern New Jersey, where I used to live. And back in, at that time, the Rascals were like gods. They were they were probably that was probably their greatest base of popularity was in northern New Jersey and in New York City and Long Island. And I had friends uh, there in 67 who were telling me that the Rascals were a better group than the Beatles. And, and by that time, you know, by that time, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane had already come out. And there were all of these reports about this incredible album. And and I just sort of said, oh, OK, we'll we'll see. We'll see how <laughs> <laughs> how, how much better they are. And and sure enough, when uh, when Sergeant Pepper came out and those same friends heard the album, they absolutely went crazy. Yeah. I have a question that I'd like to address to all of you, since I'm a radio guy. And, um, you know, if you've listened to classic rock radio all these years, even though it's changed in their demographic audience that they're shooting for, you always, if you listen to classic rock, you get the impression that nothing happened before 1967. <laughs> Unless you listen to a weekly Beatles show where they'll play early Beatles music. You rarely ever hear anything, unless it's in a specialty program. As part of the regular programming of what a classic rock station does, you would think that nothing happened before 1967. Huh. And you always hear that Sgt. Pepper really marked the birth of the album as an art form. And yet, there are some really key important albums from 1967 that mm -hmm. came out before Sgt. Pepper, mm -hmm. like The Doors' first album, for example. Or a Surrealistic Pillow from mm -hmm. Jefferson Airplane. The Grateful Dead's first album came out. Jimi Hendrix, his first album came out. When those albums came out, did they receive airplay on radio? Was it strictly only the singles that you heard from, uh, from those artists? Or was FM radio developing that early on, in early 67? Or did everything just change once Sgt. Pepper was released? I, I can speak for New Orleans, sure. and then I'll turn it over quickly. Uh, New Orleans, we had two AM stations. You know, either you were a WNOE good guy or WTIX boss jock. And I was a WTIX boss jock, and I wouldn't have been caught dead listening to WNOE. But my <laughs> friends who would, you know, argue with me about it, they had the same, you know, we didn't hear album tracks normally. When the Beatles first came out, you did hear I Want to Be Your Man on the radio because Ringo was the favorite Beatle in the U.S. at the time. And then you really didn't hear album tracks. And with Pepper, you know, an exception was made for the Beatles. So, you know, while you would have heard Somebody to Love by the Jefferson Airplane, you know, you would not have heard Today or songs like that on AM radio. It just mm. wouldn't happen. Mm. Yeah. But did this really signal the birth of FM radio? Well, I think it was – I don't think that Sergeant Pepper created FM Radio, no. the format had been a little bit before it, but it certainly legitimized it to where you could have Murray the K, who was the ultimate, you know, teeny bopper disc jockey. All of a sudden, now he's on FM and he's playing the entire album at a time. So right. uh, I think that the timing couldn't have been any better for the Beatles, mm. or, or quite frankly, the format. Yeah, in mm -hmm. in, in, New, in New York, uh, WOR FM, which was one of the first. Uh, FM FM rock stations had debuted just about a year earlier, and uh, and so yeah, they uh, I remember hearing because I listened to it all the time, and um, and indeed and, and especially um, in the case of Murray the K because of the fact that he had uh, he had ties to to Brian Epstein and to Nat Weiss the Beatles uh, American lawyer and all. 
And so um, he was uh, the you know they were sort of feeding him a lot of the new uh, the new rock. So he played Jimi Hendrix, and he played the Bee Gees, uh, and and Cream. Uh, because of the fact that for that you know for that brief time Robert Stigwood had a uh, an association with uh, with NEMS, but also yeah they uh, the w- WORFM definitely played Jefferson Airplane they definitely played the Doors, so um, but obviously you know AM the two the two AM stations in New York you know really didn't play any of that material unless they were hit singles like, as Bruce mentioned, Somebody to Love or White Rabbit, mm-hmm. things like that. You know, so you, n- you really never heard Jimi Hendrix on, uh, you know, on, w- on WABC at that, you know, at least in 1967. Mm. Were there young fans who were getting into all this new rock and roll, Jimi Hendrix and The Doors and all, who maybe didn't find Sgt. Pepper all that shocking? Uh, I, I haven't found anybody that wasn't surprised by the album, yeah. at least in my fan recollections. You know, I think it, like I said, the clues were there, but it, it caught people off guard. And, and to talk more about the radio, uh, you know, you had WABC where they put out a survey and they also had an internal survey. And in their internal survey, they listed, uh, you know, several tracks from Sgt. Pepper. What I found interesting in doing the research was there was a station in Seattle, KJR, and they based their survey more on listener requests. And so during the summer of 67, um, they had She's Leaving Home, peaking at 26, When I'm 64, 23, the title track at 17, and uh, Lovely Rita got to number five on their charts. Mm. Um, The other interesting thing was to show the difference between the UK and the US, the BBC banned a day in the life and KRLA, you know, the prime station for teens in Los Angeles, uh, had a day in the life at number two on its charts, huh. blocked only by a local group, the doors with light my fire. Huh. <laughs> I think that's kind of interesting. And had it not been for the doors, I'm sure day in the life would have been number one as an album track on an AM station in a major market. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. I actually I, heard when a day in the life was played on WABC AM in New York, yeah, and mm-hmm. and that lasted uh, what a whole day at, at the most, something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Matt Weiss uh, got to him quickly on that, and uh, yeah. their survey listed it as I read the news today. That's what they called they it. Yeah, the, yeah. They didn't know the title. And as Pierce points out, it got airplay up in Canada, mm-hmm. where Nat Weiss wasn't as influential in Capitol Records of Canada had to send something out to, you know, their distributors and radio stations saying, hey, we don't have this, you know, <laughs> it's an album track, you know, don't quit asking us to send it to you. We can't do it. So, well, yeah. you know, we talked about when Meet the Beatles was first released, there were stations that played every song. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't entirely new when it came to the Beatles for that to happen. Right. right. Well, I think, look, AM stations made an exception for the Beatles many times. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. I I just found a, a web page that has um, a, a group of uh, 40 albums from 1967 arranged month by month. And it's interesting, some of the albums that were released before Sgt. Pepper, the, uh, the Doors you guys mentioned, mm-hmm. Mellow Yellow by Donovan, mm-hmm. right. Between the Buttons, or the Rolling Stones, Younger Than Yesterday, The Birds, Mm-hmm. Yeah, surrealistic pillow, which got mentioned, King and Queen by Otis Redding and Car and uh, 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 Carla um, oh, Thomas. 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 Yeah, right. Um, Aretha Franklin's "I Never Loved a Man the Way I Love You," The Grateful Dead. This next one is this next one is a good one. The Velvet Underground and Nico. Yeah. Uh, so Country Joe and the Fish, electric music for the mind and body. Howard Tate, get it while you can. I'm not even sure. I I know that one. Anybody know that? Anybody know that one off off the top? Yeah. But I think what it shows though is, and I think it might have been one of the in the um, either Al or Bill King or somebody pointed out that you know yeah these albums were out there they did sell and chart but it wasn't the impact that Sgt. Pepper had. Right. I mean, Sgt. Right. Pepper yeah. dominated the charts and the big you know and the big joke I had in the book was you know that 
headquarters comes out by the monkeys and it's number one. And then, you know, you're going to have the battle between the Beatles and the monkeys. And of course, it wasn't even close. Sergeant Pepper knocked headquarters from the top spot. But the interesting thing was headquarters hung on there at number two for a very long time mm-hmm. until the, the Doors album knocked it, you know, out of the second spot. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Pepper had that lasting effect. And, uh, you know, while all those other albums are great, you're not going to see it, you know, a $150 box set for Surrealistic Pillow, and you're not going right. to see that on the CBS Evening News. Right. Um, I, I should also point out that this list shows that Are You Experienced was released after Sgt. Pepper was released yeah. in, in August, yeah. mm-hmm. not in not before Sgt. But Pepper. The other, but, but speaking of Hendrix, and it is kind of interesting, if you look at the timeline of things, uh, the Beatles, and we're seeing Hendrix in the clubs uh, at the time they were doing Pepper, and um, they start working on A Day in the Life, and then take a break, and then Paul and I think Ringo go see Jimi Hendrix, and rather than starting back up with A Day in the Life, they start back with Sgt. Pepper, uh, the title track, and not so much from that first take, you hear it, but on Paul's overdub of the lead guitar, that is Jimi Hendrix all the way. I mean, a mm-hmm. incredible and Hendrix influenced by Paul. And then, you know, you find that uh, the legendary story of Pepper comes out, you know, on a Friday and Saturday or Sunday it is that they see Jimi Hendrix at the Seville Theater and he opens up with Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Right. Kind of returning the favor. One of the things about the album and, you know, and the stereo remix really makes it clear. I don't want to minimize John or George's contributions. But Ringo's drums come through this thing. The only way I've ever heard it like that is at the Love Theater. The stereo remix brings out his brilliant drumming. Denny Sywell, who wrote a fan recollection, pointed out that Ringo played the perfect drum part for each song. And you really feel that way when you listen to the stereo remix. And then Paul, his brilliant melodic bass runs, you know, great keyboard playing, you know, harpsichord, you listen to the piano on the early takes of A Day in the Life in that middle section where you don't get to hear all the nuances of his piano, but you do on takes one and two. It has this jazzy boogie-woogie feel that he throws in, just incredible. And then his lead guitar playing is just absolutely superb throughout. And, of course, his vocals and songwriting isn't bad. So, I mean, it, you know, it, it really is a wonderful showcase for for Paul on tons of different instruments. And then, you know, John has some great moments and George is within you without you and his guitar playing on some of the tracks. But Paul is just really hitting on all cylinders on this one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Paul, Paul's lead guitar part in Good Morning, Good Morning is just amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. The bass, the bass parts, the bass parts uh, have always been my favorite. Uh, his his bass on getting better where he does the, uh, the uh, slide down with the, with the bass. I love that. I absolutely yeah. love that. But did, did you guys feel that when this album came out, it was like the start of albums being accepted? Because I mean, obviously the Beatles are the exception to the rule. All the albums that they made before that were all strong. You know, yeah. I, don't, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. And maybe depending upon who your favorite artists were at the time, maybe the other British invasion artists, you might think the Rolling Stones albums are strong and the Kinks and the Who, but did you suddenly think once Sgt. Pepper came out, everything's changed now, and we're going to be thinking more about albums, perhaps more so than singles, because Top 40 Radio was still very strong at that time. I don't know if the, if the, if you know, we were, if anybody was thinking that critically back then, mm-hmm. but you couldn't help but notice what they did. I mean, the radio radio made notice of what they did. I mean, d- disc jockeys would talk about the Beatles, you know, like they were a class above everybody else. I mean, that great clip of Dick Clark um, running Strawberry uh, with the videos of Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane, where he's talking. I mean, uh, you know, even though he's kind of a little bewildered uh, at that, I mean, he's clearly talking about the, the the Beatles in a different time and space than everybody else. I mean, it's not like talking about Frankie Avalon or, you know, or you know, Bobby Rydell. I mean, obviously not. And I think everybody kind of recognized that it was. Uh, I mean, there was no. There's no way that you did not know something was happening, as you know, like the Dylan lyric. Um, I mean, you yeah. couldn't help couldn't help but notice. You could, and, and for me, um, 
I always felt we were lucky in the U.S. in one way, and I know that the people in Britain, because the way they heard it was different, but to me, a day in the life was the end of the world, and I always found that little input at the end distracting, and, you mm -hmm. know, and, you know, and I personally prefer it without it, although, you know, when I heard the stereo remix, the first time I heard it, it didn't have it, because Giles Martin had not added it in back in February. When I heard it, uh, you know, a week or so ago, it was there. And it was like, yeah, OK, that works. But to me, I just loved at the end of that album, I literally thought, my God, I've just heard the end of the world, you know. And I know I wasn't the first person to think that. I think a lot of people felt that way. So, you know, for us, it was a little bit different in the U.S. that, you know, when that thing ended, you know, it just stayed with us. I think a lot more than the British people had that little extra bit at the end. In fact, uh, one of the in the early years of FM rock radio, especially FM progressive rock radio, it was kind of like a badge of honor, you know, for a disc jockey radio personality, whatever you want to call it, to stretch out that last call <laughs> and not say anything <laughs> until until it was. It would, I guess, I think it was, I think it was timed at like 43 seconds mm -hmm. right, yeah. at that time, <laughs> and you know, and not say anything, you know, and then say, you know, something like the Beatles. The yeah. day in the <laughs> they were probably getting memos from the front office about dead air, you know. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So you know, um, Bruce, you probably know this because of your other research um, into you know, capital and, and its dealings with EMI. But um, in the book that comes with the remaster, they say why the U.S. didn't have the run-out groove. Do you, do you have that information? You know, what I had always theorized was the way that, you know, this is from a timing element, capital liked to get their mastering done as soon as possible. So they would jump the gun sometimes. And timing is certainly an aspect of it where that runout groove was recorded right around the time Capitol was ready to master the album. But also, Capitol mastered the albums differently than what was done in the UK. Mm. In the UK, you mastered an album, and by mastering we mean you had something on a lathe that you were cutting it into. And you would cut this into a lathe from the tape, and that was called your master. And when you were doing that, you would be at the controls where you could add, you know, echo, you could uh, add compression. There were all sorts of little things you could do at that point in time. And that was the mastering process. And when you finish that master, the master was then used to make a mother, and then a mother was used to make stampers. And in the UK, what they would do is uh, a mother might be good for only a certain number of stampers. So... You know, and a master could only make so many mothers. So, in effect, what would happen was in the UK, they would do one master and then they would make, you know, a bunch of mothers from that, but they would save one mother that wouldn't make stampers, but would make what they called submasters, where they'd be going backwards and making a bunch of new masters, which in turn would make more mothers and stampers. In the US, Capital did not do that. Capital would make, say, 20 or 30 masters for a Beatles album. And so if you think about it, if you're a capital engineer and you know how difficult it was to put that whistle at the end and to put that, you know, run out groove gibberish yeah. at the end, if you had to do that 20 to 30 times, yeah. you'd go crazy. Right. So I think that, you know, that as a matter of necessity, they really could not have done it the way they mastered the album in the U.S. It would not have been practical. They probably wouldn't have because of that reason, but it turns out that um, the day that the Mono Master, at least, was shipped from England to Capital, that very night was when they went in to make the, um, yeah. the run-out groove to, to record the gibberish. Yeah, and that's the point. So Capital would do the mastering as soon as possible. They they wanted to be ahead of the game, and that's why, you know, the Penny Lane promo single had an earlier mix with those mm -hmm. trumpet flourish at the end because they had already cut it and distributed it. They they just did things that way. So I think from a calendar standpoint, yes, that's correct. But I just don't see an engineer at Capitol trying to do that 30 times. Right. Hmm. 
Uh, Let me add one one very, very quick thing. Um, I think Bruce mentioned the Beatles, the Messengers from Time Magazine. That's available on Amazon as an ebook for 99 cents if anybody is interested in getting it. And it's got the, you know, it's got the cover story and it, it's, uh, I'm looking through it now. I don't know if it has a review of the album, but it does have a, sto- a story about the album from 67. So if anybody wants to, you know, get into that historical stuff. Is this uh, the, the uh, hard copy or? No, this is an ebook. It's an ebook. Oh, okay. E-book. And then yeah. also, uh, since we're running out of time, uh, I would actually be reprimanded by the author's union if I didn't plug my book. And Absolutely. say that my book is available through my website, www.beetle.net, in, in multiple editions. We have a standard print edition, which is $30. We have a collector's edition, which comes with an, an outer case, a poster, and a bookmark. And also, you also can get the PDF of the book uh, for free included in that. And then also, the book's available as a PDF. And of course, if you order from the website, you get them personally signed by me and we do appreciate those orders all right okay well this has been a fascinating conversation with bruce spicer and before we go i know that al has something that um he'd like to say i do yes <laughs> <laughs> that's you al uh okay uh, actually i'll do this very briefly because actually we are running over and and also i i posted something last week to pretty much announce that uh, announces but um, this is actually going to be my uh, my last uh, episode uh, as a contributor to uh, to things we said today the, uh, the the overriding reason and you've heard <laughs> you've, you've heard a very good example of it with uh, an hour of me frothering through this uh, this episode is that um, I, uh, I I'm just tired of yelling at myself when I listen to the uh, the podcast because I'm not because I'm not communicating uh, the way I feel I should be and uh, I've always um, I've always communicated better through the uh, the printed the the written the written word and um, and I haven't really done much of that. In the three three and a half years or so since uh, since changing times, and I really need to um, uh, shall we say get back to uh, to doing that, and uh, and so uh, so I have uh, decided I'm going to retreat from uh, from uh, from things we said today and get back to doing more uh, more in the way of writing. But I wanted to. Uh, I, I do want to thank uh, Ken and uh, and Steve for bringing me, you know, for bringing me on back when, uh, whenever it was two, 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 three years ago, and uh, and of course to thank Alan who came on with me at about the same time and who I've known really longer than any of you because uh alan and i used to exchange videos <laughs> back in the uh in the early uh in the early 80s when mm-hmm. uh, when uh when we were both uh in our early years of contributing to uh to beetle fan and so wanted to you know thank alan obviously for his uh you know for you know for his his friendship and collegiality and all the rest of it and uh, again, just want to th- and want to thank all of uh, all of you for the uh, the very nice comments. And uh, I'll be I'll be continuing to listen, and because uh, I'm a podcast addict, and uh, hopefully I'll uh, you know come on from time to time to vent my spleen or whatever. <laughs> yeah, we hope so. <laughs> yes, yeah, we do. Um- you know, we all read uh, the thread of what was on Facebook, and you know that your presence here, your contributions on this show have been massive, and it's reflected in, in all the statements that our listeners have said. So you will be sorely missed, and uh, let it just be known that anytime you want to be a guest on the show, you are welcome back anytime. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, and, and, and thank everybody very, very much. And Al, I, I appreciate you being on the show with with me and uh and i really do appreciate that and also al 
when you talk about the written word, uh, anyone who wants evidence of Al's writing, countless examples and Beatle fan in addition to his own book. And I'm proud to say two pieces by Al in my most recent book. Mm hmm. OK, so if um, any of you would like to get in touch with Steve, why don't you give the folks your contact information? Beatles Examiner at Gmail dot com. I'm uh, I have a personal Facebook page and I have a Beatles news group called Beatles News and Commentary. And I okay. should I, sh I should mention that for people who are inter who want to contact us for the show, they can write things we said today radio show at Gmail dot com. We have a things we said today radio Beatles fan Facebook page, and you can download the show at podbean.com, and we are also on YouTube. So uh, if you don't want to download the show, you can stream it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Okay. We should also point out for people who are curious, we are going to continue as a threesome for a while. So we enjoy each other's company, and we're going to continue with uh, Steve, Alan, and myself for the time being. And um, if you'd like to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Just want to make sure that I mention that uh, I just did an interview with Brian Ray from Paul McCartney's band that you can hear on my website. And Steve, I believe you interviewed him as well. Yes, I'm working on, I'm working on that at the moment. Yes, I am. And Brian talks about his uh, new album with his band, The Bayonets, which has just been reissued called Crash Boom Bang. And uh, I also want to mention that um, I do give uh, tickets away through my website and uh, for concerts happening in the New York, New England area. And I will be giving away tickets. Actually, if you listen to the show right now, up until this Saturday, which would be the 13th, um, tickets to see the Weaklings at the Cutting Room in New York City. Just go to my website, the Tickets Giveaways page. You can find out how to win a pair of tickets to see the Weaklings live. Okay, and once again, Bruce, your website is? Beetle.net, Beetle with no S. And my email is just Spizer, you know, my last name, at Beetle.net. Okay, well, Bruce, thanks so much for, for being here on the show. Much luck with the book. I can't wait to read it myself. Thanks. And, uh, and I'm <laughs> glad to be there, believe me. It's, uh, it's always a lot of fun. Sitting around chatting Beatles with knowledgeable people and friends. Okay. And Alan, if people want to get in touch with you, they can do so how? Um, probably the best way is on Facebook at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And, Al and Mr. Sussman, you will be on Facebook for people who want to talk to you, correct? Uh, Facebook and Twitter. Okay. All right. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining us, and for Steve, Al, Alan, and Bruce. But, um, thanks for <laughs> but, um, yeah. Um, thanks so much for being here, and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.